You know, whether or not you scratch your head with this hand or scratch your head with this hand really isn't a driver of much. So that kind of thing doesn't have to be computed. So in any case, um, that's the probable future database. Now, all the action is in the present. The present is where choice is. That's where free will gets executed, just in the present. We live in the present. We often waste time in the future and in the past, but we live, and that's where the rubber meets the road, is in the present. As this database, as time goes on and delta t clicks and clicks, what used to be future probable turn, goes through the present, choices are made, and then it becomes past, right? So we have the, the future probable, which is everything that we could possibly do and the probability that we do it. Then we have the history thread of ours, which is everything we actually did. And then we have the, what I call, unactualized history of everything we could have done, but didn't. You see, now that's all really the same database. It's just that future prior reality that's moving through time, through the present, into the past. And you have the things we did, and then everything else is all the things we could have done but didn't. But they all have probabilities associated with them. So this is something I could have done but didn't, but the probability of my doing that was, and there's some number there. So you are in these databases. You're in these databases, future and past, as a model. Okay? A model of you. Now, what's, what does a model of you mean? Well, it's the same as you, except there's no free will. The only difference between you interacting here in the in the uh, present and you that's been calculating these databases is that the one in the databases doesn't have free will. All the rest of it's just exactly like you. Okay, because the ones in the database are just projected, what you might have done. You see? So that's these databases. It's really just one big database, but it, uh, it uh, is broken into three to make it a little easier to understand. Okay, now. So, yeah, well, I'm not going to do questions just yet. We'll do questions in the next series. I'm going to have a real struggle just getting through this in the two, in the two hours. So, uh, but we'll talk about anything you like in the next couple of hours. I'm going to talk a little bit about the larger reality system just because this idea may be easier for you to understand in terms of the larger reality, but the fact is it's exactly the same here. There's no difference. It's just sometimes a little harder to see what's going on in your you know, in your own reality than it is if you look someplace else. So uh, let's talk about the non-physical reality. Okay, uh, um, you are consciousness, your reality is data, right? Those are some basic facts. Okay, now experience within your various reality frames that are defined and limited by your interpretation of the data. Okay, so you get data, you have to interpret it. How do you do that? You have to interpret in terms of yourself, in terms of your own experience. It's the only thing you can do. You can't interpret in terms of experience you don't have. So everything you get has to be interpreted in terms of your experience, who you are, what you are. It's interpreted in terms of your fear, your ego, your knowledge, your beliefs. All those things affect how you interpret. So everybody's walking around in their own reality in as much as everybody's interpreting it according to their own experience base. Now, this is, a mu this is a multiplayer game, so we also have to share reality, but we all have a little different reality that we live in, that we create from our own interpretations. Now, how does this play out out in the larger reality frame? Well, I'm gonna take some examples out of Bob Monroe's books because I'm guessing that, you know, if there was one book that I think most of you probably would have read in common, it would probably be The Journeys Out of the Body. Um, maybe I'm wrong there, but you'll get the point even if you haven't read it. Do you recall when uh, Bob and Roe, at one time he was out of the body and he was coming back and he ran into this wall. There was this big wall and it was, he couldn't get over it, he couldn't get under it, he couldn't get around it, he was stuck. And he started to get really worried. Well, what was that wall? Are there big walls in the non-physical? No, that was Bob's fear. That wall was a metaphor. It was an interpretation of a fear. Now, a lot of our fears are not intellectual. They hide, they're down below the intellectual level. Okay, these are fears that are cultural, fears that are you know, um, basically human in many, in many cases. Okay, uh, another one I liked that was uh, Bob and Rose stuck his hand in a hole and it, and it got a hook through it like he was a fish being hooked. What was that? Well, that's a metaphor for his fear 
of the unknown, for the fear of the boogeyman. You know, the thing that's under the bed that'll get you at night when you're, when you're six years old, that's that fear. Again, not an intellectual fear, okay? So when you're in this larger reality and you get the data and you interpret it, you see, that's how you interpret it, because you have fear, because you have ego, all right? Um, people who have uh, uh, near-death experiences, often these people you'll read, travel through tunnels, right? They're, they kind of find themselves outside their body in the operating room, and then they kind of see this tunnel, and there's light at the end of the tunnel, and they move through the tunnel. Does that mean that the larger consciousness system is full of tunnels? No more than it is full of walls. Why do they go through tunnels? Because they have a belief. The belief is that you cannot get from A to B unless you travel. Well, how do you travel? You have to have a sense of motion. So you create a background against which you move, you change. They can't get anywhere if they don't travel. The tunnel is there because they have a belief that they have to travel. You don't have to travel in the large reality. It's just data. You just switch data streams. Everything is teleportation, if you like. You just switch data streams. You don't have to travel. People doing out of body fly around at first. They do a lot of flying here and there. Flying is unnecessary. That's just a, a belief that you have to travel, you see. These are beliefs. Um, the white light. People run into the white light. You know, the great, or, you know, the orifice. Uh, they run into a being, and this being is just a bright, brilliant white light, and they feel love. They feel connectedness. They feel one with all, and it's just the sweetest, warmest feeling, and they kind of bathe in that for a while, and then it goes away. A lot of people have had that experience. What is that? Well, one, if something communicates to you and gives you information, you immediately, because of your experience, define that as a being. So immediately, it's a being. And if it's a being, you automatically kind of give it a head and shoulders and, you know, it kind of looks like us because that's our metaphor for being. And then, because all the energy and the good feeling you get, then you make it a very powerful, wonderful being. You know, it's, it's God or it's, you know, something really wonderful. Well, what you're connected to then is just the larger consciousness system. You're experiencing the larger consciousness system. The being of light that you see is your own metaphor for that. What you feel and the message you get and the connectedness is absolutely real. But you can only think about it in terms of your own metaphors. Um, back before Bob Monroe and we had um, uh, astral projection, those people doing astral projection all had silver cords connecting their outer body to their body. And if you have read back in the old literature, you know that there's always silver cord. How come there aren't any silver cords? What happened to silver cords these days? You know, Bob and Ray didn't have any silver cord, and neither do most other people who get in the outer body and venture around a larger reality. The silver cord was a metaphor for a belief they had that if the outer body, the soul, if you will, left the body, the body would die. It needed that connection, or the body would just kind of crumple up and go away. Well, they had to have a Silver cord to reflect that belief, like a diver needs an air hose. You know, it was the same sort of thing. That belief kind of diminished in our culture, so silver cords diminished, went away in our culture as well. See, just metaphors. A problem is that many people who go out into the larger reality believe that what they see is what is there. What they see is their metaphor for the data they get. Okay, that's a different thing. Um, You know, we get metaphors, people see angels, saints, relatives, you know, Uncle Fred comes back and, you know, talks to them, all this sort of thing, and you dress them up, you make them to suit your metaphors. So if you see Uncle Fred, you know, he's always wearing that same plaid shirt that he always wore when you remembered him. So it's not that, you know, he's been dead for 10 years and he hasn't changed his shirt, you know, that's not it. It's just that that's your metaphor for Uncle Fred. That's the way you see him. So that's the way you dress him. And when you see people that you don't know, or know nothing about, and again, people, that's whatever it is that you get data from, you interpret it as a people, how do you dress them? You put them in a robe, because a robe is, you know, kind of nondescript. So that's why robes are such a big fashion item in a non-physical, because we dress people in robes that we don't really know very well. And why do we do that? Because we would be very uncomfortable standing there conversing with somebody who was naked.